Hey guys, welcome back to Canon Cinema. I'm Amanda, otherwise known as AMX ND Reviews on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Today I will be reviewing episode four and five of Loki. I honestly can't believe that it's almost done. Like, the finale is this Wednesday. I cannot believe how fast the time has gone. It went by faster than Falcon and the Winter Soldier for me, to be honest, but maybe because I was a bit more excited for Falcon and Winter Soldier and I was really sad for it to end. But Loki has been growing on me. As If you guys have been following my Loki reviews, I've liked every single episode better than the last. I liked episode five, but episode four just exceeded my expectations. And maybe it's because episode three of Lamentis was really just bland and boring for me and four really just picked it back up and got me invested in the show again and more excited for the second half of this. So episode four of Loki, we see that Sylvie and Loki are stuck on Lamentis and they have this very powerful moment and we know that they had to be saved by someone. They were saved by the TVA, obviously, because their connection was so strong. And I know that everyone is like, well, is it platonic love? Is it a type of, you know, soulmate love? But it is, you know, they're the same person in alternate reality. So we don't really know how this even how this even works, what it falls into. But Sylvie and Loki have a moment at the beginning of episode four. We know that the TVA is made up of different variants because that was the information that we got from episode three. So then the TVA finds them because of this palpable, powerful connection that they have and they bring them in, they arrest them. They're back at the TVA. I was happy they were back at the TVA because there's a little bit more structure that goes into the episode. And we have Mobius, we have Renslayer, and re realistically, like, the show is about Loki, we understand that. Sylvie is a great addition, don't get me wrong, but Owen Wilson's Mobius just brings so much to the table, and I absolutely love, love his dynamic with Loki. So at the TVA, we see that Loki and Sylvie are divided. Loki makes, you know, makes a little joke saying, why does she have more security than I do? And he's back with his quips with Mobius and we, we get to see that. But Mobius keeps him separate. Renslayer keeps Sylvie separate considering what her backstory is and what we find out about Sylvie taking from Asgard and, and all of that and, and what and the role that Renslayer kind of played in that as well. So they keep her separate. Loki and Mobius, again, have incredible conversations and Loki explains to Mobius that there's nothing going on between him and Sylvie. He doesn't know what the feelings are there, but then Mobius kind of says like, you guys created this event, like you created this and that's why we were able to find you. So we want to know more about it, but Loki has no idea. He kind of, he, he reluctantly responds to these questions and he, he wants to protect Sylvie as well. So he doesn't say that there's anything there. And then Mobius gets rattled. He gets annoyed. It's like, stop lying to me. I know that you're Loki, but I thought that we had a better friendship than that. And Loki ends up telling Mobius that everything that he knows about the TVA is a lie, which is a really great moment for Owen Wilson. Again, Owen Wilson's performance throughout the episodes have, has gotten stronger and stronger. And I love that. Uh, and I love that scene between the two of them. So Mobius gets a bit frazzled. You see that something broke inside him, but he tried to keep his composure. And again, that's how great Owen Wilson is. So he ends up putting Loki in this time loop of this uh, this one moment that he had with Lady Sif. And I have to admit, I love Lady Sif in the Thor movies. I think that Jamie Alexander is amazing and she should have been involved in the MCU a bit more, but it was great to see her. And it was a time loop of Lady Sif basically punching Loki and hurting him. And the more we see that happen over and over again, Loki releases some of his demons. He comes to a point where he understands the person he is, the person he was, how he's changed. He, it was really a reflective moment within the time loop. 
So there are so many secrets in this show. Mobius and Hunter B-15 found out that Hunter C-20 had died, but Renslayer didn't really give them the full story. But finding out that Hunter C-20 died is what set everything off with Mobius and Hunter B-15 to kind of question what the hell the TVA actually is. So with all that line of questioning, we have Mobius going to Loki having you know, those conversations about the TVA, Loki eventually telling him and pushing him to kind of find out what the hell Renslayer was talking about. So that was one. And then Hunter B-15, Gears returning for her and she ended up breaking Sylvie out of the, her chambers because when Sylvie enchanted her in episode two, it's still in her mind. It was lingering in her mind, like, how do I have this memory? And then hearing about Hunter C-20, dying kind of fishy why does she die no one actually knows so 100 b15 took it upon herself and one musaku gave another great performance with the little screen time that she has she knocks it out of the park so we have that happening we have renslayer lying to mobius mobius takes renslayer's tem pad to figure out what happened to hunter c20 and yes renslayer was a part of her death so Long story short, they do break free, but Mobius goes to break Loki out after he figures everything out. He's like, yes, we'll work together. We'll figure this all out. Renslayer walks into the chamber uh, that Loki and Mobius were in and we have a pruning, ladies and gentlemen. I did not see this coming. Renslayer prunes Mobius, and we were, I was very shook with that. I was like, no, you can't do this to Mobius. But we also didn't know where the people who were pruned would go. We had no idea until the post credit scene in this episode. So we have that going on. Renslayer takes Sylvie and Loki to the timekeepers. The timekeepers looked weird. I love the production design. I, I love that there were some great shots with the smoke and different, you know, the lighting and all of that. But the, the timekeepers looked weird. And then we end up finding out that they're fake. They're completely fake. And Renslayer also sees like, oh my God, like they're fake because Sylvie ends up chopping one of their heads off. And they're, they're fake. They are fake. The timekeepers are fake. The TVA is nothing, but now we have to figure out who the hell is behind this curtain. I also love the fact that Loki and Sylvie have a moment mid-battle, but you know you're not supposed to turn your back mid-battle when the big baddie is behind you. So as Loki was about to explain his feelings to Sylvie, Renslayer prunes Loki and I lost it. I'm like, he died again, like again. How many times we have to see Loki die? We obviously know that he's gonna come back. And he did, he did in the post credit scene. The way he came back, you know, he's on this planet, complete wasteland. He wakes up and we see more Lokis. We see alligator Loki, we see kid Loki, we see boastful Loki, and we see classic Loki. And what a way to end an episode. Loki is with his fellow Lokis on this like deserted land that kind of look like an alternate version of 2012 New York, the Battle of New York. So it was just really interesting to see that. Episode four had everything that I wanted. It is just such an exciting show. It was awesome and it got me excited for episode five. Now going into episode five, we see that the TVA is literally crumbling. Renslayer has no idea what to even do with Sylvie at this point because Sylvie holds her captive at the end of episode four. Loki's on this freaking wasteland with the rest of his Lokis and episode five called Journey into Mystery kind of just makes you question everything even more, but it was so, so cool. So at the beginning of this episode, right off the bat, we have fantastic camera work, the angle of the camera completely flipping upside down to show that stuff is gonna get wacky in this episode. And then we have the incredible score that just elevates the episode every single time. We go through those gold elevators and we go past everything 
to an aerial shot of where Loki and the other Lokis are, and we get a very fast paced line of questioning where Loki's like, where am I? Who are you? What's happening? Blah, blah, blah. Then we have classic Loki played by Richard E. Grant who stole the show. I wanna see more of classic Loki. He was absolutely fantastic in this. And we see him just grabbing Loki, come with us. That big puff of smoke is Elioth and we have to get the F out of here. We have to get out of here and go underground and stay protected. And then we see them going through. It was all very fast paced. They established the location, where they were, what they have to stay away from. And it was very, very quick. And I love that opening. It's one of my favorite openings of the series, apart from episode three, when Sylvie just walks in to the TV and kicks some butt. I love that. And then as the episode goes on, we see more of who Loki is. And this is what the importance of episode five is. It is a very strong episode. So the Lokis take our Loki to this bunker where they set everything up. We just learned so much about Loki and the other Lokis in alternate timelines. And I really do think that it was a good decision to put them all in a room together, especially for our Loki, who's kind of questioning who he is especially after looking at his highlight reel and knowing that he ends up dying in another timeline. We see the decisions that others made and he wants to avoid dying. They And Lokis know that they avoid, they try to avoid death as much as they can, or they, you know, they try to avoid death. They try to, get out of everything, they'll fake their death. It, Lokis are known to survive. Then we flip back to the TVA where Sylvie and Renslayer are together and Sylvie questions the hell out of her and who's behind all this, who's behind the curtain. Renslayer's obviously lying to Sylvie, you can tell because of the way she stalls with Miss Minutes, but she also tries to gain Sylvie's trust and like, let's work together. Let's figure out a way to understand who is behind the TVA. And she's stalling for time so they can get Sylvie in the perfect position to kind of prune her, arrest her, whatever the hell it may be. So the one thing that I did find throughout the episode is that like Miss Minutes is really shady. When Rensselaer was asking Miss Minutes for files, Miss Minutes was also stalling, but not for the same reason that Rensselaer was stalling for Sylvie. There's so much going on with Rensselaer and Miss Minutes off screen in a different type of situation. So I am kind of interested to see how they're gonna tie things up in episode six. But yeah, Miss Minutes was stalling, Rensselaer was stalling, Sylvie was kind of on board at one point, it's like let's work together like Renslayer, that's fine. But it just felt really sketchy. In the middle of the episode, Renslayer was stalling so the guards could come get Sylvie and then Sylvie ends up getting away and pruning herself. Now, where do all Lokis go? They go to the exact same empty void at the end of time. So Sylvie's right where Loki is. She sees Elias, she's in that empty wasteland. And all of a sudden we see this car driving in the middle. There's pizza slice on the top of this car and it's Mobius, which is questionable because we're under the assumption as an audience member that all Lokis go to the same empty void at the end of time. Why is Mobius here? And I hope we find out in episode six as to why Mobius went there after he got pruned, because if Hunter C20 also got pruned, would she not be there? Right? Exactly. Mobius picks up Sylvie and they're gonna go try and find Loki. Now, in the meantime, Loki is with the other Lokis. As we saw, we figure out what the hell happened with alligator Loki as well. But, but as Loki, our Loki tries to come up with a plan to go kill Elioth, guns a blazing, he opens the hatch to the bunker and there's a million other Lokis that show up. So classic Loki, Richard E. Grant is like, oh great, now they're all here in one spot. And 
madness ensues, chaos happens. President Loki is probably one of my favorite versions of Loki, but it is the funniest moment in the episode because our Loki is just watching this chaos unfold and is like, what is what is me doing? Like, why are you guys so crazy? And the facial reactions are just hilarious, hilarious, while they try to get away from all of these Lokis in the bunker to go get Elias. So obviously they escape, Richard E. Grant puts some projections of him, boastful Loki, kid Loki, alligator Loki, and our Loki in order for them to get out to go to Eliot. So as that happens, the car kind of pulls up and then Sylvie and Loki are reunited. More importantly, Mobius and Loki are reunited and they're all together. So Loki and Sylvie devise a plan. Loki tells Sylvie his plan and Sylvie's like, you're dumb, why would you just run into this big puff of smoke that could kill you. Why would you do that? And Sylvie said that I will enchant Elioth and Loki and the other Lokis are like, damn, that's ballsy, but she can do it. She can totally do it. So we have that plan. Sylvie's gonna get ready to enchant uh, Elioth. Before Sylvie goes into the suicide mission, we see that Sylvie and Loki share a moment. My peeve with this particular moment is that in episode three it was revealed that loki came out as bisexual it was a solid conversation it could have been done better it could have been done earlier because tom hiddleston as loki's been in the mcu for 11 years like now they chose to do it him making him bisexual and him saying that is it enough to say things anymore like please just show us i would have preferred like a montage of him going on dates in asgard with like men and women that would have been more beneficial it's just it's not enough to just say it anymore especially after like 23 24 films and like two television shows like it's not enough at this point and the representation needs to be there for Sofia DiMartino to kind of confirm in an article that it is love between them. It's what it is now. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and be like, oh yeah, they're cute together. Like I like their chemistry. Don't get me wrong. Everyone's like, oh yeah, they're a couple of besties. If I looked at my best friend like that, it, it's definitely not platonic love here like that. They had stars in their eyes looking at each other. And then Loki conjures up a blanket and puts it around Sylvie as well. These are cute moments, don't get me wrong. And it's very new territory for both of them to express their feelings. So Mobius goes back to the TVA because Sylvie has her tempad. That's the only way to get out of the empty void at the end of time. And Loki hugs Mobius and says, thank you for everything, my friend. And Loki has friends, guys. Our Loki has friends. I was just really happy about that. And then Mobius turns to Sylvie as he's hugging Loki. He's like, you're always my favorite. And it's one of the cutest moments ever. I just hope that Mobius ends up getting his jet ski at the end of the series, because I'll be very upset if he doesn't. So after the goodbyes, Loki and Sylvie have to face Elias. Sylvie tries to enchant Elias. She unfortunately can't do it on her own, so she takes Loki's hand and he tries to bring out these enchantment powers out of him because he hasn't really tapped into that power set yet. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but we're seeing different power sets in this episode for different versions of Loki. We see the enchantment from Sylvie because she got a glimpse of it earlier on in the episode, proving that she can enchant Elias. And then Richard E. Grant literally saves their butts and causes a distraction as classic Loki and he's doing full-on projections in front of Elioth to distract him. And that is how Sylvie and Loki grab a hold of Elioth. They end up enchanting the entire being and he turns to dust. All of it's green and it's an opening to another realm. So that's how we end the episode and I was just 
blown away with this episode as well. There is no post credit scene, but going into episode six, we're going to finally see who's behind all of this. Do I hope it's Kang the Conqueror? Of course I hope it's Kang the Conqueror. I personally don't think that Jonathan Majors should have his debut on the small screen, considering how much weight Kang the Conqueror has on the entire MCU moving forward. I prefer a name drop, but if we do get Kang, I'm not gonna be upset because Loki as a series so far, it is such a pivotal show moving forward in the MCU. It is the most important show that you will watch in order to understand what the hell the multiverse is, what alternate timelines are. Like you really need to watch this show in order to understand Spider-Man No Way Home, Doctor Strange 2, the multiverse of madness, and God knows. God knows what else they have planned for us. If it's Miss Minutes, will I be disappointed? Yeah, because that is a weak ass villain that you would put in this show, considering that it is contained to the series. And if we look at it as to why it's not going to be Kang the Conqueror, WandaVision had Agatha and that was contained in the show. They had Hayward and like White Vision that was contained in the universe that created for that show. Then the Falcon and the Winter Soldier had Flag Smashers and Power Broker, weakest, weakest villains I've ever seen, but it's contained to that show. There was no one else outside of it that could have come in for that because of how small they made it, how compact they made it. So Loki will have a smaller villain. It could be like an older Loki, the top Loki as a variant, you know, as in a different timeline that could be running everything that would be contained to its own show. The show has always been about variants, so it would only make sense that it would be another superior Loki variant controlling everything. It is setting up the future of the MCU while still telling the story within its own universe, and that's what, you know, WandaVision, Falcon, Winter Soldier, and Loki have done so well. So Loki is getting better and better. The series is my favorite in the MCU so far out of the TV MCU series. I know I love Falcon and the Winter Soldier so, 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 so much, but Loki again, elevating the game on a different level. And it's my favorite show right now. So Loki is killing it. I cannot wait for this finale. And yeah, thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this review, please like and subscribe. You guys can always find me over at AMX NDA Reviews on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. I will probably wake up at three o'clock in the morning for Loki because I've had this internal clock where I've been waking up to watch Loki without actually wanting to wake up to watch Loki at three in the morning, but say lovey, that's what's been happening. Thanks for tuning in guys. I'll catch you guys later. Keep watching movies.